Hello, and thank you for stopping by. Uh, as you can see, our poster is titled Effects of Light Therapy on Osteoarthritis and its Sequelae in Aging in Older Adults, a Narrative Systematic Review. Um, I'm Mike Bridges, the head author here, and with help from Jeremy Hilliard and Kevin Choi, a uh, part of Pacific University. And we initially set out to look at the effects of light therapy uh, on osteoarthritis and its symptoms in those individuals who would be categorized in the aging in older adult population. So anyone over 50 uh, who was, you know, suffering from symptoms related to osteoarthritis. We eventually found around um, 22 randomized controlled trials to focus on between January 2008 and December of 2018. And using those articles, we then created subgroups of different treatment parameters, as well as treatment methods, etc. Um, so you can see in the table here, and then of course in the link to the poster itself where you can zoom in a little more clearly, there's a lot of ways that these articles uh, utilize laser in conjunction with other treatments um, or compared to different treatment techniques. So there may be some comparison from laser to a sham or maybe laser just to exercise or laser with exercise uh, or even laser with ultrasound. Yeah. And so from these articles, again, we finalized down to 22 that fit our parameters. And overall, we found that there is some statistical significance in the ability of light therapy to help improve pain, function, and quality of life in uh, our clients. However, it was somewhat challenging to really hone in on <coughs> what was really providing the, the most effect, the largest effect for individuals, uh, because parameters varied by qu quite a lot. Um, you know, the dosage of laser is gonna be really tied to the amount of energy that's supplied to the area. And that can be impacted by the wavelength. Um, and of course, you know, that wavelength of, of an LED is gonna be quite a bit different than a laser or even an SLT. So based on all these parameters, there was a huge variability in the actual energy dosage that was supplied by the light therapy device. And so this would be an important consideration for you as a practitioner to, to hone in on and research further based on the device that you're using and the exact treatment uh, protocols that you're using in conjunction with the light therapy. So thank you again for stopping by and please take the time to look at our poster. And then of course, our article that this is, uh, the poster is based off of is published in Topics of Geriatric Rehabilitation. And we've provided a link to that if you'd like to read further into it. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Rick Daigle, and thank you for viewing our poster, Situational Judgment Exam Use in the Admissions Process of a Doctor of Physical Therapy Program. For a little bit of background, the CASPER is a situational judgment exam that identifies the decision-making of individuals by assessing them on realistic and hypothetical scenarios. On top of that, multiple mini interviews consist of various stations that each focus on a different set of questions, scenarios, or tasks. We attempted to determine if there was a relationship between DPT applicants' CASPER scores and multiple mini interview scores. Secondarily, the project described the demographics in this prospective student cohort. The study collected data on the CASPER percentile score, MMI score, and demographic data such as gender, race and ethnicity, and population of city for primary or secondary education. Statistical analysis using the Spearman Road Test revealed that CASPER scores are not correlated with applicants' MMI performance, which indicates that they may evaluate different constructs. Based on the data that we collected, the gender demographics of this prospective DPT student class is comparable to that of the profession. Currently, the profession is 65% female, and our prospective cohort that was studied is 63% female. It's interesting to note that our efforts to increase diversity appears to be fruitful. Only 40% of our applicants identify as white, while nearly 30% identify as Asian, 11% from Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish culture or origin, 9% identify as Black or African American, and the remaining 11% from Native American, Pacific Islander, or other origins. 29% of our applicants self-reported receiving primary or secondary education in a rural community, which is similar to Oregon, where a third of the population lives in a rural area. 
as a collective group, the researchers on this project have determined that future research should examine the relationship between CASPER scores and demographic data, admissions decisions, graduation rates, licensure rates, and employability. Thank you for taking time to listen to this overview and, and viewing our poster. We're happy to answer any questions and please feel free to contact me at rdaigle, R-D-A-I-G-L-E, at westernu.edu. My name is Heather Harrower and my research is test retest reliability of the closed kinetic chain upper extremity stability test in gymnasts with and without upper limb pain. Gymnastics requires a significant amount of muscle energy to perform skills at a high level, especially in closed kinetic chain movements of the upper extremity, a position needed for many gymnastic skills. Current research shows that the rate of all injuries in gymnastics range from 1.5 to 3.7 injuries per 1,000 hours of exposure, with 30% of all injuries occurring in the upper extremity. According to Thomas et al., these injuries tend to be more severe than lower extremity injuries and require more time out of practice. The Closed Kinetic Chain Upper Extremity Stability Test, also known as the CKC UEST, appears to be a useful measure for female gymnasts given the closed kinetic chain demands of their sport. This test has good reliability in healthy adults. With the unique closed kinetic chain requirements of the sport, physical therapists cannot assume that the test is reliable in the gymnastics population with or without upper extremity pain. So the purpose of this study was to determine between day test retest reliability of the CKC UEST in female competitive gymnasts. The CKC UEST is performed in a plank position. In the modified test position, the participant starts with their hands directly below their shoulders, alternating touching two marks 36 inches apart for 15 seconds. For this study, participants performed three trials, and a final score was calculated using the mean number of touches over the three trials and normalized to the participant's upper limb length. Upper limb length was measured from the spinous process of C7 to the tip of the third digit of the right upper extremity. For between day reliability assessment, the gymnast performed another three trials one week later and scores were averaged for the second day as well. 18 gymnasts were recruited, eight of which reported upper limb pain, and these gymnasts competed in USA Gymnastics levels six to 10. Results showed excellent test retest reliability with an interglass correlation coefficient of 0 0.92. According to our results, the CKC UEST may be a reliable outcome measure to assess upper extremity performance in female competitive gymnasts, both with and without upper limb pain. It also appears safe to perform on those with upper limb pain who are currently participating in gymnastics. My aim is Zach Lentini, and I'm a sports physical therapy resident with Samaritan Athletic Medicine and Oregon State University. I will be presenting this research on behalf of Dr. Christina Gomez and myself. There are many ways that physical therapists assess movement quality. The most common method is visual observation, but movement analysis aided by artificial intelligence is becoming increasingly popular, including an automated 2D system called Fusionetics. There were two objectives of this investigation. Number one, to establish the inter-rater reliability of scoring between trained physical therapists of a double leg squat and single leg squat. And number two, to assess inter-rater reliability of double leg squat and single leg squat scoring between the fusionetic system and the majority score of the raters. Following a five minute warm up on a stationary bike, 12 collegiate soccer players were videotaped performing the double leg squat with arms overhead and the single leg squat with hands on hips. The Fusionetic system automatically scored the movements based on binary scoring criteria. Five physical therapists were trained in the scoring system. They watched the recorded videos and scored each participant's performance of the double leg squat and single leg squat. Intra-rater reliability was calculated with the Fleiss Kappa statistic. The results are represented by these figures. Strength of agreement between raters was poor to moderate for all scored items of the double leg squat and single leg squat. Strength of agreement between the raters and the automated 2D motion analysis system was also poor to moderate for all scored items of the double leg squat and single leg squat, except for excessive forward lean during the double leg squat. 
The present investigation on inter-rater reliability indicates that scoring of the double and single leg squat across raters using the fusionetic scoring criteria may be less than acceptable. For physical therapists that wish to implement 2D artificial intelligence systems, they should be aware that these methods may evaluate movement differently than the human eye. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Zurei Chen. Also with me here are the co-lead authors of the project, Sydney Newman and Sarah Tomlinson. Together, we will present our research project titled Effect of Age and Fall Histories on Turn Characteristics During the Turn Phase of the Time Up and Go Test. We would like to acknowledge our co-authors, Morgan, Alyssa, and Anna. Here is the background and the purpose of the study. We hope the results of this study will help us understand the specific characteristics that lead to a longer turn duration. The study participants were divided into three groups, young adults, older fallers without a history of falls, and older adults with a history of falls. Subject demographics are represented in table one. Participants were instructed to complete the timed up and go test. Whole body kinematics were collected with motion analysis. We plotted the Z coordinates from each ankle marker during the turn phase into a line graph to determine when the foot was in contact with the ground. We then identified the turning strategy by plotting each footprint location in the transverse plane. This revealed six turn strategies. The turn types identified are displayed in figure one. In pattern A, all steps are progressing forward. In pattern B, all steps are in the forward direction with the exception of step four. Pattern C, D, and E all contain one backward step. And pattern F is a shuffling pattern characterized by wide step length and minimal forward movement. Once the six turn patterns were identified, we analyzed the data to determine the percentage of participants in each group who utilized each specific turning pattern. As you can see in figure two, the young adult group relied exclusively on pattern A, whereas the faller group had a large percentage of participants used pattern F, the shuffling pattern. Table three illustrates the statistically significant strength deficits found in the older faller group as compared to both non-faller groups. Additionally, the faller group had the longest turn duration of the three groups and had the lowest overall standardized balance scores. Finally, using a correlation analysis, we identified a strong correlation between knee extensor strength and turn pattern, which may identify strength as a factor that contributes to decreased step length and utilization of pattern F. Overall, understanding the specific characteristics that lead to longer tug duration may be useful for clinicians in identifying areas to focus treatment intervention for fall prevention. Hi, my name is Molly O'Rourke. I'm a faculty member at Western University of Health Sciences in Oregon. Thank you for joining us today to explore relationships between region of education and grade point averages. The American Council of Academic Physical Therapy recommends increasing access to physical therapy education for underrepresented minority groups, including those from rural regions. So we ask the question, is there a difference between grade point averages of Doctor of Physical Therapy program applicants educated in rural communities and those educated in non-rural communities? For the purpose of this study, rural communities are populations with are communities with populations less than 50,000, and non-rural communities have populations greater than 50,000. Program applicants were asked to indicate whether they received primary or secondary education in rural communities. Cumulative and prerequisite GPAs were collected and grouped according to rural and non-rural primary and secondary education. 35% of applicants were educated in rural regions, and 65% were educated in non-rural regions. Due to a non-normal distribution of our sample population, a man Whitney U was performed. Statistical analysis revealed that within the applicants to one graduate DPT program, there was no significant difference in GPA between those educated in rural regions and those educated in non-rural regions. The strength of association between rural region of education and GPA was 0 0.007 for overall GPA and 0 0.083 for prerequisite GPA. <laughs> rural education does not appear to affect GPA for 2020-2021 applicants applying to one DPT program. Analysis is ongoing as additional applicants may offer further information about potential relationships between education and rural communities and grade point averages. Continued research is needed as to how region of education affects diversity of applicant pool of the Doctor of Physical Therapy programs. 
Thank you so much for listening to our talk today and looking at our poster. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me at the email at the bottom of the slide. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Stripling. I am a physical therapist with Portland Public Schools in Portland, Oregon. And I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my colleague, Dr. John Parmigiani uh, of Oregon State University. Um, this is our poster, Teamwork Makes the Dream Work, how engineer and therapist partnerships can help solve everyday mobility challenges. So we're interested in what leads to successful interprofessional collaboration and how this type of teamwork helps achieve successful outcomes for people experiencing disability. Our poster is a case presentation on an example of this type of teamwork between myself and other Portland Public Schools physical therapists and Oregon State University College of Engineering students and faculty at the Prototype Development Lab. We partnered to design a solution to help public school students with disabilities practice power mobility skills. OSU's engineering students designed and built what we are calling a power mobility platform that allows the user to remain comfortably positioned in their manual wheelchair while accessing a power mobility base. In our prototype, this base is controlled by a joystick. You can see pictures of the prototype design process here on our poster in the top right corner. OSU's Prototype Development Lab brings together engineering students with community members to solve real world problems through cutting edge technology and deliver results that have value for the user. In our poster, we highlight what things made our collaboration successful, and we share tips on how to recreate similar PT partnerships in your community. Thank you for your time. Comparison of conservative care versus surgery after anterior shoulder dislocation, a systematic review and meta-analysis by Kelly Warner and Olivia Vanderbeer. Recurrent shoulder instability is a common complication following an anterior shoulder dislocation. This can be treated either with surgery or conservative care, both usually involving a period of immobilization. Our research question was, as compared to surgery, is conservative treatment as effective as surgical treatment? and improving stability in individuals after acute first-time anterior shoulder dislocation. So throughout our systematic review, we used three search engines, PubMed, Medline, and Embase. Our inclusion criteria was that it had to be a first-time occurrence of anterior shoulder dislocation, and it had to compare only surgery to non-surgical treatment. We excluded studies where the subjects in the conservative care only group chose to have surgery while participating in the study. After we got all of our articles, we input the data into CMA and calculated effect sizes as an odds ratio using random effects model. Then we ran subgroup analyses and meta regressions on our moderator variables. Based on the search criteria, 14 studies were chosen to be included in our meta analysis. The information presented in table one is representative of the subjects included within the studies who experienced a first time acute anterior shoulder dislocation. There's a variety in the types of surgery performed between the studies. However, a majority of them had bank cart repairs. Figure two shows that a significant large effect was found with the conservative care group 10.8 times more likely to re-dislocate compared to the surgery group. Because of considerable heterogeneity, subgroup analyses and regressions were run on six moderator variables listed in table two and three. Studies involving older subjects had less recurrent dislocations compared to those with younger subjects. This is assumed to be because younger subjects tend to be more active and involved in sports. A greater amount of activity provides them with more opportunities to re-dislocate, compared to older adults who may be less physically active. Our findings reveal that surgery may be a necessary step in the recovery from an acute anterior shoulder dislocation until inconsistencies in the conservative care treatment can be decided upon. We would like to thank Dr. Morelli and Dr. Warren for their technical advice throughout our project.